Hi, good morning. This is Dr. Patrick Agnew. I'm a podiatrist in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm the director of the residency program at Eastern Virginia Medical School. And I'll be introducing the topic of foot and ankle update. So I bring you greetings from the American College of Foot and Ankle Pediatrics. I'm a past president of that college, and it's a relatively small group of podiatrists in the U.S. that uh, emphasize pediatrics in practice, although I treat all ages. There's some uh, places I work here. On the left is the library at Eastern Virginia Medical School. Here is one of our uh, medical and surgical facilities. And here is the Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters. So I have collected data on people with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and related connective tissue disorders for well over 30 years now and have put a lot of the presentation in uh, abstract and poster formats and national lectures and regional and local lectures also. So this is just a probably incomplete list of all the different studies that we've looked into. It's very difficult to, to publish a referee peer-reviewed uh, journal article on the topics that I'm going to be talking about because really people with connective tissue disorders are not a homogeneous group. There's a broad variety of presentations, a spectrum, if you will, and a lot of the techniques that we've been developing are still in development. We're using different forms of hardware, different uh, apparatus, and trying to find the optimal. Uh, incidentally, on your right of the screen is my son and his now wife, uh, back when he was a cadet at Virginia Military Institute. That's my youngest son. So we talk often in podiatry about uh, having um, uh, hypermobility. And we'll talk about specific joints like hypermobility of a first metatarsal phalangeal joint or hypermobility of a mid-tarsal or subtalar joint. This is uh, important in terms of planning appropriate management, but what I think is often missed, unfortunately, is the fact that just because you're hypermobile in one place doesn't mean you might not be hypermobile everywhere. We teach medical students in general, podiatry students uh, in specific to look at things like tumors and fractures and infections on a regular basis. But rarely have I heard it mentioned that they should think about connective tissue disorders. Um, sometimes uh, as I get into rheumatology and we'll talk about autoimmune disease, they'll get some background on that, but still not sufficient. And then the whole topic of connective tissue disorder doesn't even come up. So uh, all the students that rotate through our residency program and all of the residents who stay on for several years to become surgeons and ready for independent practice get a detailed experience as we have had people come from all over the world to our practice and to our treatment facilities. And uh, they have very uh, extensive hand-on experience. So. Uh, just the spectrum of hypermobility, of course, is, uh, continues to expand, and the Ehlers-Danlos Society seems to be kind of a big tent organization, uh, often looking into things that may or may not eventually turn out to be Ehlers-Danlos syndrome specifically or variants, but importantly, share enough phenotype and maybe some genotype that they can the, the people who are uh, afflicted with these conditions can benefit from uh, fellowship and similar research from people who may have more specifically Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. So when I'm teaching residents and students and other podiatrists about connective tissue disorders, of course, I'll mention things like Marfan Syndrome and osteogenesis imperfecta, which I suppose is the uh, prototype uh, connective tissue disease affecting also bone more specifically and, and often accompanied with fractures. Marfan syndrome has uh, very many similarities with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, but a very specific phenotype and for some reason, uh, previously a very broad recognition. Uh, on the, your right is my oldest son, who 
was a or remains to be a, a professional surfer, was a competitive surfer all around the, uh, the U.S. and other countries for, for many years. He is very flexible, but as far as we know, doesn't have any connective tissue disease. And on your left is uh, just a slide of one of our patients demonstrating just how mobile some of their joints can be, uh, bending the, the first toe back a lot further than it should naturally go. Uh, as we gain a deeper understanding of connective tissue disease, um, we certainly can hope for things like gene therapy in the future and can more specifically target other therapies. But it has been fairly uniform that foot and ankle problems penetrate nearly 100% of people with hypermobility uh, in connective tissue disease. So uh, my mentioned in that I was uh, the senior podiatrist in the Navy for a while and had occasion to operate with a broad variety of, of platforms, including Marine Corps Amphibious Assault Vehicle Battalion uh, during Desert Storm. Here's uh, one of those vehicles. And they're pretty special vehicles, very specialized in their capabilities, able to go on land and sea and deliver troops and munitions onto targets. Uh, soft tissue handling is uh, one of the special considerations we associate with um, connective tissue disorders, and it, it is uh, challenging at times. We can talk more in detail about how to manage those challenges if we have time later. Vascular fragility is uh, recognized in a number of connective tissue diseases, and is unfortunately also often associated with catastrophic or uh, premature sudden death syndromes. Bone fragility is a specific characteristic of some connective tissue diseases, but also I think is widely shared by a lot of them because of uh, disuse atrophy. Even if there might not be anything wrong specifically with the collagen portion of, of, of a person's bone, the bone can become soft and brittle through uh, a relative less quantity of physical activity. Overpronation is a concern in podiatry, often addressed in a variety of ways. But what we found, and we'll go into this in more detail, is the foot might, nece might not necessarily overpronate, but sag. So if all of the joints in the foot with one out of every four bones in your body in there, there are lots of little joints, lots of little ligaments trying to hold them together. Uh, if those ligaments are, are weak, then the, uh, the bones can shift out of position and, and basically the longitudinal arch of the foot can just droop or sag. Even though a patient might be hypermobility all over the, hypermobile all over their body, they may still have a tight Achilles tendon, which is something that well, kind of surprised me a little bit at first, but then thinking about it, different types of collagen and different types of tissue, tendons might be relatively tight uh, or the muscles surrounding them might be doing extra duty to try to protect hypermobile joints. Ankle instability seems to be a very, very common finding and carries with it a lot of potential pathology. This is my daughter, my oldest child, who... Uh, is a veterinary tech at our animal shelter in Virginia Beach and kind of a cat whisperer. She, uh, she takes these maladjusted cats and makes them adoptable <laughs> among uh, many other duties. Um, some common foot problems that are found in people with hypermobility are hypermobile joints. Also flat feet with or without overpronation, again, possibly sagging and ankle instability, as we touched on the previous slide. Some common problems, like uh, bunion, for example, is, is kind of a slang term, not a real good scientific definition, sometimes called hallux valgus or hallux abductor valgus, um, may present very differently than it would in a person uh, with a connective tissue disorder. So here is a person who's had actually an operation on their left foot, the one with the label on it. And some another doctor tried to correct a bunion deformity 
and found out that closing a joint capsule, the ligaments that surround the big toe joint, may not have been successful. Fluid and lubricant leaked out and created this pseudotumor or a large sort of ganglionic cyst. So some manifestations of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome in connective tissue disorders can include hypermobility at multiple joints. And we train our residents and students to look for a Biton score um, and also more specific things about the foot, like deformities you see in the bottom right panel here. More on that in a moment. And sometimes patients will like to do tricks for us, okay. which we try to discourage. We let them do that maybe one time and then never again. And then uh, we just know that they're, they're able to do that. Some congenital problems like alopecia equinovarus and metatarsis adductus are visible here on the left and the right, respectively. And these things are more common in people with connective tissue diseases, probably because of uh, intrauterine pressure on the fetus. The fetus has soft bones and strong ligaments uh, in an otherwise normal fetus. But with connective tissue disease, both the bones and the ligaments being weak can permit the bones to be deformed. Uh, sort of a packaging defect. So what are our goals in treatment? Well, here's my youngest son at BMI uh, trying to achieve some of his goals. Uh, our goals are to um, align and maintain functional anatomy. So orthoses are arch supports have been used quite a lot, but unfortunately data is not excellent. And so there's some controversy about their utility and which materials to use and um, how to design them all are controversial, again, unfortunately, because of inadequate data. Arthrodesis or fusing joints, in our experience, has been a bad idea, often very unsatisfied patients. Turns out if you fuse one joint in a person's foot and all the other joints are hypermobile, they all get very angry about that and can become painful and more dysfunctional than they were before as they take up slack for the joint that no longer moves at all. Osteotomies or cutting bones and moving bones and Bolting them back together can be a good idea, uh, but uh, and there's certainly a lot of experience with osteotomies, but they also have to, one must keep in mind the fact that the bones may not be healthy and strong due to disuse atrophy. Talotarsal stent, we'll spend a little time on in a moment, also controversial and uh, possibly used inappropriately or overused in some other patients, maybe kind of tailor-made for people with hypermobility issues. Uh, ligament replacement is also an area that we've done quite a bit of invest, investigation and experimentation with and, and with very uh, impressive early results after about eight years or so of doing that. So Taylor Tarsal joint, uh, my daughter with her husband, um, it's, it's some history variation. We're gonna fly through this in, in the interest of time. Um, but uh, again, back to the principles, of podiatric intervention, alignment and maintenance of functional anatomy. We want to avoid skin injury because skin closure may be difficult. Uh, we don't want to rely on ligaments. They have failed us once. And we want to select the time of intervention carefully so that we maybe can prevent problems down the road. Um, goals of talotarsal stent specifically should be the relief of pain, improving joint alignment, and function and interruption of pathological progression of, of pathomechanics. Um, correction of deformity is sometimes a goal that people go after, but whether or not a foot has a uh, normal appearing arch is really not the goal of treatment. Making the uh, foot function better should be. This is my son in my old backyard with a surfing trophy. That's my oldest son, he, again, competitive surfer. And here's when he was a kid back in history. <laughs> here's some history of uh, talotarsal stabilization. We'll just get through this. Uh, there, and now my son today, a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger. <laughs> um, and there have been some advances in subtalar uh, devices, including now polymers, metals, and absorbable materials have all been used. Uh, this is kind of the state of the art. This is a, a well thought out. Um, advice for subtalar stent. And here's a patient who had to have this stent removed in order to have this stent placed. And then 
She also made a necklace out of it, along with other things that she's found. These are snake bones. Um, <laughs> very creative person. The size of the implant matters quite a lot, um, as does the size of a wave. <laughs> uh, there was a study back in 2007 in which they were experimenting with absorbable versus non-absorbable sinus tarsus stents. And they really didn't find any particular advantage or disadvantage to either one. But what they did find is that the sinus tarsus and the cannulus tarsus, which it connects to it, are smaller than one might think. And that force, so therefore, first forcing an overly large device into the sinus tarsus in order to maybe get a higher looking arch, again, is not recommended for people with connective tissue disorders. Regarding uh, ligament replacements, uh, there are uh, options here that, again, may have been overused early on, but just because a procedure is maybe easy to do or seems less invasive doesn't mean that you should necessarily do it for every patient, but maybe, again, kind of tailor-made to patients with connective tissue disease where fusing a bone might be indicated with a deformity as is seen in this x-ray at the bottom left. Uh, often it'll be recommended to fuse this joint uh, in order to get full correction, but we were able to achieve quite a lot of correction with endo buttons and strings holding these bones together. Uh, this is a guy who was on the, uh, the doctor's show and was advocating what I think he called a Cinderella procedure, kind of a cosmetic foot surgery. The whole concept of uh, aesthetic foot surgery kind of makes me throw up in my mouth a little bit. Feet are funny looking at their best. We want to make them work better, not look better necessarily. Now, why do we even bother with things like bunion operations or lifting up someone's arch? Well, when joints are malaligned, when joints are hypermobile, uh, they are more likely to develop degenerative changes. Of course, a lot of people would just like their bunion fixed or maybe have a more reliable ankle. Uh, but what we don't want to have is a joint get to the point where we have to do more joint destructive processes. Here is kind of a last ditch effort to rescue a joint. We have a patient who had arthritis in her big toe joint. We removed that arthritis and placed in a cadaver graft along with a number of other procedures. And uh, this was a patient with, with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, as you might be able to discern by just how far down I could flex that toe to get at the joint. Let's see if this one runs. Incidentally, all the hardware and software illustrated all through my slides are from companies I do not receive any, uh, any form of compensation or benefit from. Um, this is a procedure that we illustrated on x-ray two slides back. And this is just a, uh, a schematic of it um, in, in process. So here, the two bones are connected with a, uh, are first drilled and then connected with an endo button and suture apparatus. And as the suture is tied, the deformity is corrected. Cute. So here's another patient who uh, you can look just at the skin on her knees and legs and see common changes seen in people with more classic type Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome where skin injuries as a child have added up and preoperative bunion deformity and pain. And postoperatively, we've done a, a small osteotomy here to realign the joint cartilage, but also we've connected these bones together with those endo buttons and suture. And here you'll see two more anchors, bone anchors, and there's suture on the medial side of this joint helping to hold it straight. Um, apologies for the squeamish. These are cadaver specimens that we use to measure the strength of, a, of the ligament that's supposed to hold the big toe straight. And we found it takes only about 40 to 50 pounds of tension to pull that ligament apart. But happily, the tolerances of these bone anchors we're using are far in excess of that. Sorry about the noise on the slide, but this is a cadaver. Let's stop it for a second. This is a cadaver specimen who has a bone anchor already placed in the first toe and another bone anchor placed in the metatarsal head. There's suture on the medial side of the joint. 
and you'll see in a moment how we can straighten that using this bone anchor system that allows uh, variable tensioning. There you go, I'll turn off the sound, sorry. And as you see, we can straighten up a joint with these little bone anchors in the future. Uh, what's become rather popular is the method of stabilizing ankle joints using bone anchors and suture. Uh, this has been very successful and very popular in sports medicine. And although we don't use this specific system in our practice currently, uh, we ha have found that we can replace the ankles in a patient with a connective tissue, replace the ankle ligaments in a patient with connective tissue disorder with a very minimally invasive procedure and it can be walked on pretty much immediately, as can the, the first toe. So how strong do we need these things to be? Well, we find that the suture materials and the anchors we use are, are well in excess of what's generally needed by a, a patient with a connective tissue disorder. So we've gotten to the point where we're now using a, a subtalar stent and bone anchors through an incision just this big. You can see on where my cursor is on the, uh, on the image of this patient who has Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and has had her ligaments replaced and the subtalar joint stabilized. Here's uh, something made for me by a person with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, illustrating how to, or, or schematically, how these bone anchors and suture materials fit into the foot. Now, just because we've stabilized one joint, again, other joints may be vulnerable. We found a number of people in which the perineal tendon can sublux around the fibula here. So in this patient, we've cut the bone and swiveled it backwards to deepen that groove. Uh, and we found sometimes in a patient who, who has a nice, well-stabilized foot and the subtalar joint in the ankle, higher up ligaments, like the ligament that holds the tibia and fibula together can fail. And here we see bone anchors trying to hold those bones together as the ligaments have failed. That is the end of my uh, organized lecture on the topic. I'm looking very forward to the live question and answer series. And uh, I appreciate everyone's time and attention.